The Ten Commandments Weekend 2009, Ancient Words Ever True, continues on 3ABN. Hello and welcome back to uh, Ten Commandment Weekend. Boy, we're having a great time here, aren't we, folks? Yeah. Shelly had everybody this morning. I heard Shelly say, if you're, if you're happy and you love Jesus, say praise the Lord. Maybe we should say that now. Praise the Lord, right? We do. We have a want for those of you at home. I wish you were here. We have a wonderful group of people. And what I like about it, they're happy. Because you know why they're happy? They've made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of their lives, each and every one of us. And those of you at home, uh, if you've not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, we think this is a great time. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. We'd invite you to get rid of all your fears and your problems and turn them all over to God. Doesn't mean you won't have any, but you will be in God's hands and He will give you a peace that passeth all understanding in the midst of the storm. We still go through storms, but we don't do it alone, right? So we encourage each and every, every one of you watching around the world to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Then Jesus says, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. So we're sp particularly, this whole weekend is dedicated to uplifting the great law of God, the Ten Commandments. A lot of churches and a lot of Christians around the world they talk about nine commandments, some talk about eight, and I'm not sure how many of the rest of them, but we believe that all ten commandments, God gave them for a reason. He didn't give nine, did he? Didn't give five, didn't give four, he gave ten, and I believe that we should keep all ten commandments, don't you? But we do it in honor because of our love for the Lord Jesus Christ and for what he has done for us. It's our privilege right now to have uh, Sister Jennifer LaMountain, and Jennifer, we love you, we appreciate you, and the ministry you've been singing for many, many years. And, uh, yeah, oh, she said, don't say too many. And listen, we can tell by looking at you that you haven't been around a long time, right? You're still, you're still young to most of us out here. Now, we'd give you a chance to say something, but, you know, we only have a short time. She's got a, new, a baby that's about two years old, and that could be, she could talk about that for Yes, I could show you pictures. Pictures, pictures the whole work. Well, we're, we're going to do that another time. Oh, okay. But tonight, what are you going to be singing for us? Oh, well, I'm singing a, a praise medley of hymns that everyone will recognize and love, Praise to the Lord, and then a new version uh, from my new album here recently that we did of the Lord's Prayer. All which right. I, I know that you'll enjoy. It's a beautiful orchestra. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> there probably isn't anything that I would rather do than to be able to sing about the relationships in my life. And let me tell you, the relationship with our Heavenly Father is something that's worth singing about, right? <laughs> Amen. Praise to the Lord. The Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. Oh, ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he befriend thee. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here. King of creation, oh my soul, praise him, for he is thy help and salvation. Oh, ye who hear now to his temple draw near, join me in glad adoration, join me in glad
it's wonderful to know that God is God <laughs> and nothing else, no one else. He is all we ever need, and this is how he taught us to pray until his soon return. Dear Father of heaven and all earth below, blessed be your name. May your kingdom come and you Amen. Thank you, Jennifer. It's my privilege at this time to introduce a friend, a neighbor, a brother in the Lord, and this pastor, Jim Gilley, president of Three Angels Broadcasting Network. And I just praise the Lord for Jim and Camille and their family, for their love, for their dedication to God's work, and for what a tremendous asset they are with this ministry of Three Angels Broadcasting Network. And Jim has been a pastor for a long time. He was an evangelist a pastor, worked for many, many years for the church on a voluntary basis because of his love for Jesus. Jesus said, go ye into all the world. And Pastor Gilly has taken that great commission seriously. And uh, it's a great honor for me to introduce him at this time. Thank you, Mammy. Appreciate it, buddy. Show about our heads. Father in heaven, as so we open the word tonight, we pray for the power and the leading of your Holy Spirit. Father, we would have you be completely in control, just as you were at Mount Sinai when you gave these Ten Commandments, written by your very finger. May every word that proceeds from our mouths tonight be approved by you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I really believe in God's Ten Commandments. Sometimes people look at uh, Christians and they say, how could you believe in the Ten Commandments? And my answer is always, how could you not believe in God's Ten Commandments? When you look at the context of how they were given, you remember that God had brought his people out of Egypt. And these people had been slaves. And now he is speaking to them. He is telling them what he is like. And he says to them in the 20th chapter of Exodus, beginning with verse 1, God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Amen. The first of the Ten Commandments. When I was a boy, I went to a little church school. There were six kids in that church school at the time that uh, I was there. I think the biggest year we ever had was eight. And uh, they thought they were going to have to add uh, another room or something because <laughs> we it was such a small place. But um, television was new in those days. And it's hard to realize now, but I never saw television until I was, oh, about eight, nine years old. I remember the first time I ever saw a television. And I could not believe it. There was a little store, a little place in town that was in the television business, and they had placed a television in their front window of the place, in the show window. And they put a speaker outside, and people would sit out on their cars <laughs> and watch television. Hard for some of you to realize. How many of you ever had that kind of experience? I, all right, you're showing your age, but... Um, <laughs> I remember on Front Street in Tyler, Texas, where I grew up, watching that television. And you know the program that we watched? It was wrestling. <laughs> and we would go down there on the nights when they were having wrestling on television, and we would watch it. It was a little different in those days than it is now. I don't think it was any more honest then than it was now, but it was a little different. And uh, all these fellows like Luthez and some of these guys, that he was the world heavyweight wrestling champion. We would watch these individuals wrestle, and then we would go home and emulate them. We would build a little wrestling ring, and we would get in the ring, and we would wrestle with each other. And then when I went to school with these other young people, and most of them were boys, there were one or two girls, the rest of us were boys, we would wrestle. And we would each one be a different individual, and we would take one of the wrestlers, and uh, somebody would be Gorgeous George, or somebody like that. They never gave me that title, but um, <laughs> we had a tremendous time. But sometimes when you're wrestling, we would get a little upset with each other. You know what happens. And I remember one day that Jimmy Don McCoy was wrestling with Dan Buckingham, and Dan was my closest friend. And Jimmy Don had Dan down, and it had gone beyond wrestling now, and he was hurting Dan. And Jimmy Don was bigger than the rest of us, quite a bit bigger than the rest of us. He was several years older than we were, and he was strong as a, he could absolutely was as strong that, as a full-grown man. In fact, I remember one time we had a health lecture come through town, and, 
and he was bragging about how strong he was and he said I want some young man to come out of the audience and hit me in the stomach and I'll show you how strong I am and he was standing up there in fact this was the first vegetarian I'd ever met <laughs> by the way and he was also selling some kind of a something in a bottle that uh, papaya juice or something that was supposed to really be healthful and and he was showing how good this was and how strong it was and he said I want some young man to come here and Jimmy Don went up and he said hit me as hard as you can in the stomach and I thought don't do that sir <laughs> and Jimmy Don hit him and the man doubled over <laughs> he said I wasn't ready for that you know but he didn't ask him to hit him again, I tell you that. <laughs> but Jimmy Don had Dan down, and he was really working Dan over. And I felt like Dan needed some help, and so I ran as hard as I could, and I dove right into the pile. And uh, I hit Jimmy Don evidently in the back with a knee or something. I don't remember what it was, but it angered him, and he stood up, and he hit me, and I can see that fist coming to this day. <laughs> he didn't hit me like that. He hit me like this, right across my neck. And my head went over on my shoulder, and I could not bring it up. And the muscles began to tighten, and it went tighter, and I went in to the little schoolroom. Now, we were a pretty active bunch of kids, and the the teacher that had been there had already given up and left. And uh, <laughs> so they brought in a substitute teacher. And I don't know, I, she was not young. Uh, she was not 60, she was not 70, she was up in her 80s. But, <laughs> but she was, she was tough. And she said, straighten your head up. And I said, I can't. And I hate to tell you this, but she took my hand like that. You know, in those days, we got, we got weapons. Usually, it wasn't on the hand either. It was another part of the body. But uh, <laughs> she took that, and she whipped me with a ruler across that wrist. I remember to this day. I still couldn't pull my head up. I couldn't get it up. I went home that night. I was very, very sick. The next morning, my mother took me to a chiropractor. The chiropractor worked on my neck a little bit. He said, this is going to take a little longer. I thought one of the greatest things that he did, he said, I don't charge for children. He said, uh, and I thought, boy, that's a, that's a, a good deal. I mean, you know, that's the best price you can get. And uh, so, and I thought, my folks will bring me back now for sure. They don't have to pay. And then we went back for the second treatment, and we went in. He was in a cast, and he was like this. <laughs> and he had had an automobile accident. <laughs> and he said, I would really like to help you, but I can't. <laughs> and I went out of there like this. <laughs> Gradually, my head got a little better, but it, ne it was always there, the pain, a little bit. I would get these horrible cricks in my neck, and I would, it, it was always there. And then the pain went down into my back, and years later, I was really suffering from still back pain, all of it. I, I didn't realize at the time, but it was all as a result of that blow. When I was the conference president in Arkansas, Louisiana, the treasurer was Art Nelson. Art Nelson's a wonderful man, good man. He was a good treasurer. And Art went to a chiropractor in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who practiced what they call NUCA. Now, there was a program on 3ABN not long ago talking about NUCA. Uh, they was, it came from down in Orlando, Florida, um, and they, they did an interview with a, a NUCA doctor. I'm not recommending any medical things. 
I'm just telling you what happened, all right? So, and when we would go to board meetings at Gentry, uh, Art would go to Tulsa, go a few hours early, go to Tulsa and get a treatment. And I would tease him about going to get his treatment. And I would say, well, Art, did you go see your quack over in Tulsa? And he would assure me he did. But I still had such pain that by this time my doctor was giving me pain pills, which I had never taken in my life, but I had started taking pills so I could survive that pain. One day it got so bad the pain pills weren't helping anymore, and I said to Art, Art, would you give me the phone number for your quack? <laughs> I said, I'm willing to try anything. Went to Tulsa, Oklahoma, Dr. Robert Brooks, Brooks Spinal Care. He practices NUCA, which is the National Upper Cervical Chiropractic Association. That's what it stands for. They only work with this plate. This top plate here, right under uh, the skull. Now, I'm not giving you all the technical Im information. I'm just telling you, I call it a plate. They'd call it something else. But um, that's it. There's no cracking you or anything like that. Their theory is this. If they get that right, the rest of your back and body fall into place. And if you uh, are walking and, and not, say I had one leg shorter than the other and all that kind of stuff, they said, if we can get this right, you will be all right. And they gave me a treatment. The first day, the first time that I got the treatment, I could tell the pain was gone. I could tell it was gone. And I still had some of those pain pills. And I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep these just in case. And Dr. Brooks says, you won't need them again. He said, you won't ever need them again. And I've not taken one from my back since that day, nor for anything else except right after the surgery I just had. The only time. But not for the back. They got that plate right. And my back fell into place. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. If you get that right, everything else will fall into place. I guarantee you it's true. You get it right and you don't have to worry about anything else. You're not going to try to make idols. If you are really, truly worshiping God, trusting in God, putting God first, you, you're not going to want to break His Sabbath. You certainly will not steal, kill, commit adultery, do any of those things. Because this is right. When you get right with God and you trust Him as your God, it will all fall into place. Amen. You see, we see this with Jesus. This is the kind of person that he was. He was God on this earth, showing us what God would have us to be. You know, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they came out of a polytheistic environment. They're, the Egyptians worshipped everything. Anything that came out of the Nile, they worship. They worship the Nile to begin with. And then they worship if anything's in the Nile. If that's, if that's deity, then anything in it must be deity. And they worshiped the frogs. And they worshiped the flies. And they worshiped all that stuff. They did. That's why that the Lord used all those things and gave them their fill of all those things when those plagues hit. He says, you like frogs? All right, I'll give you some frogs. <laughs> you like flies? You will have some flies. But God, the concept of one God, this comes to us from the Bible. This comes to us from the Hebrews. This comes to us from God himself. 
the concept that there is one God, and he says, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, our problem is not atheism. Now, there are two kinds of atheists. There's the theoretical atheist. This is the one who has thought things through and has theories and therefore comes to the place where he does not believe that God exists. That's the theoretical uh, atheist. And then there's the practical atheist. The practical atheist doesn't study anything. He just lives as if God does not exist. He just goes forward with no regard for there, having to, for there being a God. He doesn't even take it into his mind that there might be a God. That is the practical atheist. But atheism is not what we're talking about here. By the way, I, I believe with all of my heart that God is God. I don't have an atheistic bone in my body. I believe in him. I trust in him. With all of my heart, I trust in him that he is our God. And then he says here, though, that you shall have no other gods before me. What gives him the right to do that? What gives him the right to say that? Well, first of all, he is the creator. And I have a lot of people that today are telling us, well, maybe he created the earth, and well, maybe he did not. And sometimes they think they can be Christians and believe in evolution. My friend, if you believe in evolution, you don't believe what God says right here. And this part of the word he wrote with his very finger. This is the foundation of it all. He wrote it with his finger. And remember that when you get down to the fourth commandment, he says, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested. He created it all in six literal days. Sometimes people say, well, I believe God created the world, but I don't believe he did it in six days. Why not? He could have done it in six milliseconds if he'd have wanted to. But he chose six days. Wouldn't that have been something to see that? See, I think we're going to see creation ourselves. When he recreates this earth, I think he's going to do it again in six days, and then we're going to have a glorious Sabbath that we will spend the first Sabbath on this earth. It's going to take place, folks, after six days, literal days of creation. I believe that with all my heart. We'll be able to see it. We'll see it take place. We'll see it happen. And when we look at our Creator, we realize that this is the message of the three angels. This is why we talk about this so much on the Three Angels Broadcasting Network because this is the message. Remember in Revelation, the 14th chapter, he says that we should fear God and give glory to him, the one who made this earth, the creator, that we are to fear him and give glory to him our maker, our God, and our creator. Amen. When we look at God, the question to me is, why would we want another God? Why could we even think that there would be something that we could have that would be as great as God is? When we look at what he's done for us, the creation of this world, the creation of us, the creation of the plan of salvation because we failed and he gave us this plan by giving us his son and then he showed us what he is like by giving us his son when Jesus came that was the greatest demonstration of all as to exactly what he is like our God, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus. You see, when we look at him, we see what man was meant to be 
in the first place. Man was meant to be the way Jesus is. That's the perfect person. The perfect one is Jesus. It also shows us what God is like. We're made in the image of God. So we are supposed to be as God is. And Jesus shows us God in the flesh. When we look at him and we hear what he says and we hear him say things like love your enemies. To us we think that's strange, that's abnormal. But no, my friend, that is true normality. Because that is the way God is. That's the way God wants us to be. Just like Jesus, that's what he wants for us to be. When you look at, uh, at him, we, we see him and we see him talking about what type of person is going to occupy the kingdom. And we look at the rich young ruler. We find this story in Mark, the 10th chapter. It says, Now he was going out of the road, and one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now he was asking a good question. He was asking the right question. You want to ask the right question. I heard about a salesman who was knocking on a front door. A boy was sitting on the front porch and he said to the boy when he came up, he said, is your mother home? He said, yes, she is. He knocked on the door, nobody answered. He knocked on the door again, nobody answered. He knocked again, nobody answered. He turned to the boy and he said, I thought you said that your mother is at home. And he said, she is, but I don't live here. And uh, <laughs> so you want to ask the right question. And this young man was asking the right question, but he wasn't ready for the answer. So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. When you really analyze this, what Jesus is saying is, uh, Are you calling me God? Jesus was God. And he was hoping, I believe, that this young man was recognizing that he was more than just a good teacher, but that he was. God in the flesh. And then Jesus said to him, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Now Jesus could have said to him, no you haven't. And he'd have been right. But instead, he begins quickly to point out where this young man has not. Sometimes people point to this and they say, well, Jesus didn't mention the first four. But Jesus goes right to the point and tests him on number one of the first four. He says to him, one thing you lack Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come. Take up the cross and follow me. And the Bible says that he was sad at this word. He went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now sometimes people read this, and they get the idea that that's what everybody's supposed to do. My friend, the great physician did not give one pill for everybody. This pill was meant for this young man. This is not the pill that might be meant for you or for me. But it was his problem. Just having money does not mean that a person is not spiritual. In fact, I have seen some of the most spiritual people I've ever seen were the most successful. I remember a man by the name of Rex Calicut. Rex Calicut loved the Lord with all of his heart. 
And Brother Rex and I spent a month together one time. We talked a lot. We prayed a lot. We, we talked about the Lord an awful lot. And one thing when we got on this subject, he said to me, Jim, I, everything I have is God's. Everything I have, I just manage it for him. He said, I could give it all right now to God's work. But he said, I can multiply it more by managing it and continuing to give it at this time. But he said, when I pass away, everything I have is going. And basically, everything he had did. There were some that went to family, but uh, really only because uh, a very powerful preacher by the name of Ben Leach overly said, just please don't cut your family out. Remember them because Brother Rex was so involved in God's work. And the work is still receiving blessings from those things that he gave. So he was a steward. And when we have the concept that we are stewards, then my friend, you could have all the money in the world and it would not affect you spiritually. But when we think the money is ours, I don't care if you only have a hundred dollars. Then you may need to go sell. If you get the concept of it being yours. God says that he owns the cattle on the thousand hills and that he owns the hills themselves. And so we must trust him at that. But this man, this was a problem. You see, he had made a God out of his possessions. And there was a great concept at that time that if you had money, then if you had money, you were going to be in the kingdom. That was a sure sign that God had blessed you. And then Jesus says something here. He says how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And then in verse 30, 24 he says, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches. He clarifies it. It's not having riches. It's trusting in riches. You don't trust in money. Boy, if we've ever seen a nation that all of a sudden has found out, in God you trust, not in the dollar. Amen. It's been our country in the last few months because we have seen things that some of us never thought we might ever see. Corporations and organizations that were thought to be strong and seen those go down. You don't trust in riches. And then he says, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The eye of the needle. Now, if you go to Israel, they will show you a little gate that's on the side of the big gate. And they will tell you that that's what he meant, that that's the eye of the needle and that a camel could get through there if it wasn't too big a camel and if he got down and if you pushed and you got him just in the right position he might go through there but it would be difficult for that to happen. Then you'll find some that'll tell you this is a wrong translation and it really didn't mean a camel it means a needle and it means a rope. Let me tell you, you know what I really believe it means? I think it means the biggest animal in Israel, which was a camel. And I believe it means the smallest hole, which was a needle. And it meant that a camel can't get through a needle. It's not going to happen. Why do I believe that? I believe it because of what it says right after that. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Now this is the question. Forget the rich young ruler. Forget rich people. Forget anything else. Who then can be saved? This is the question. And what does Jesus answer? He says, with men it is impossible. You cannot save yourself. 
We've all tried to do it. You see, that's making a God out of ourselves. Thou shalt have no other gods before you. The biggest God that we have to worry about is the God of self. Putting self, wanting to save self. That is something that we all have wanted to do. Be as God, not like God, not God-like. But Adam and Eve wanted to be gods. And that's where sin came in. With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Amen. Now you see, this desire to save ourselves is so clearly pointed out in Scripture. If you go back to Hebrews, Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and uh, the beginning with verse 1. Now, it says in verse 1, chapter 12, therefore. Now, you've heard this said before, but I'm going to say it again. When you see a therefore, you want to know why it's there. What's it there for, right? <laughs> and it's there for referring to that which came above. And if you go back to chapter 11, you see how people are saved through faith. You see how God has saved people through faith all through history. This is not a new concept in the New Testament. It's a concept that has always existed. When you put God first, thou shalt have no other gods. It all falls into line. And your faith in him causes it all to fall into line. Chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, who's it talking about? All of those people in chapter 11 who were saved by faith. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. What is that? Sometimes we get the idea that that sin which so easily ensnares us is some secret sin or some problem. Let me tell you what that sin is. That is the sin of a lack of faith. That is the sin of not trusting in God. That is the sin of trying to save ourselves. Because we fall into this so easily. It ensnares us so easily. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What a message. What a truth. When you get it in line, when you find out, this is my God, I love him, I worship him, I trust him, and I know what he's like because I see Jesus in the Word. And I know that this God is a God of love. Amen. And this God wants me to choose love. And you see, my friend, we must be connected to him. Sometimes we come to meetings like this and people will say, I had to get my batteries charged. I just had to charge my batteries. No, that's not what this meeting's about. You see, we're not, spirituality is not like that. It's not that you can charge a battery and then you let it run down. We don't operate that way. We're like a toaster. We don't work unless you plug it in. We have to stay plugged in all the time. We had a storm here recently in this neighborhood, and our power was off for several days, and, and uh you know, if you don't have power, you can't fix toast. <laughs> Your toaster won't work without power. And I will tell you something else. You will not work without being plugged in. Constantly plugged in. I am the vine, ye are the branches. John 15, 5, sometimes we want to be the vine. We're not made to be the vine. We're the branch. We're connected to the vine. The Bible says that 
we have this treasure in earthen pots. We are not the treasure. We're the pot. And the pot wants to be the treasure sometimes. But the pot is not the treasure. Jesus Christ is the treasure. Amen. We are just these earthen pots. That's all that we are. And we have to be the ones who are connected. The ones who are connected to him. And are trusting in him. And making sure that we are not being under the control of other gods, which may be anything. It may be money. It may be religion. You see, I cannot and should not and must not love my church more than I love my God. As much as I love my church, that has to stay below my love for God. My love for God has to be first. My connection with him has to be first. I remember when I was baptized, I was nine years old, and I thought, I will never sin again. <laughs> and the next day, I got in a fight with my brother. <laughs> and my mother said something to me. Don't ever say this to a kid, please. And to just think you were baptized yesterday. <laughs> and I felt like, Oh, man. I was nine when I was 15. I was baptized again. I was in Wichita Falls, Texas, uh, selling books, sleeping in a tent where HMS Richards Jr. was the pastor, and Henry and Dick Barron were holding a meeting, and I was helping with that and selling books during the day. And I remember walking back to Dick and saying, Dick, I want to be rebaptized. And he put a robe on me and he said, Go around. I was the last one. HMS Jr. didn't even know I was coming. But he handled himself very well. And they took me just as if I was part of the program. And he baptized me. And I came forward thinking, I will never sin again. <laughs> We must be plugged in constantly to Jesus. With us, it is impossible. You see, it, my old legalistic self, I get to the place where I want to save myself. I do. You do. It's in us. It's kind of like the devil, Lord, please help me. We pray, Lord, please help me. You don't find that prayer in the Bible. Help me, Lord. Help me to do what's right. That sounds like you're moving a table, and you grab one end and say, okay, Lord, I've got my end. If you'll get your end, we can move this table together. He's got to move the table. It's just too heavy for me. It's supposed to be too heavy for me. In the Garden of Eden, Man made the wrong choice. He made the choice to disconnect. You see, we were never made, meant to run without being connected to God. Never. We were made to be connected to Him. And Adam and Eve chose to be disconnected. When Jesus came, He was totally connected. This is why he says, I can of mine own self do nothing. He received all of his power, all of his strength. Everything that came to him, came to him from his father by choice. As an example of how we are to live. Fully connected, fully at, and with him at all times. I'm very excited about the prayer movement that's taking place in our church. I feel good about it. When it first started out early on, I got involved with some of the, the prayer techniques. And uh, for instance, like taking the Lord's Prayer and praying down through the Lord's Prayer. Other techniques of praying. But when I got into Scripture, I saw that it says pray without ceasing. 
And then I begin to understand that praying is not so many hours spent on my knees. Prayer is realizing my complete, total dependence upon God every second of the moment. And I don't have to actually be praying. You know, I breathe without ceasing as well, I hope. <laughs> you, you do too, right? We don't have to think about it even at times. And prayer has got to be so much a part of us that we don't, are not even thinking about the praying. It comes automatically. As we enter into that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we are praying without ceasing. It is there with us at all times because that connection has to be there at all times. There is no, no time that we unplug. There is no time that we can say, I can do this on my own. Because He is the one that gives us the power, the strength. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. None. Not one. And when we get that into place, everything else will follow. He changes us, and it's His changing. He is constantly reaching out to you. You are changing. You may not be what you want to be, and sometimes you say to yourself, if I were converted, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't think that. I wouldn't react that way. That's a sign you are converted that you are turned off by the way you did react. It just simply means that we got somehow the connection with Him was momentarily broken. But we can keep that connection open and keep it with Him. And He changes us. He believes in you. He totally believes in you. I remember one time I was riding with a friend and he was playing a song. He said, I want you to, to listen to this song because I'd never heard the song before. And it was from the man of La Mancha. And the song was the impossible dream. And I listened to that song. And as I listened to it, I became one who enjoyed listening to that song. You see, salvation is an impossible dream for me, but possible for God. Amen. Possible, he says, with him, all things are possible. In that story of the man of La Mancha, there was a woman. And the man of La Mancha sees her. This is a woman who is a prostitute. And he calls her Dulcinea which is a beautiful name. She says, that's not my name. She says, my name is Aldonza. She says, it is not Dulcinea. And she yells at him, and she is obviously a woman of the street. And then he sees her again, and this time she's been raped by a bunch of men who are traveling, and he cries out to her, and she, Dulcinea. She says, no, I'm not. And years go by. And this old man is lying near death. And a woman comes into the room. And this woman is beautiful and stately and clean and cultured. And he says, who are you? And she says, I'm Dulcinea. You see, she had been changed by beholding Jesus. We become changed Amen. by trusting in God and making Him our only God. We become changed. Amen. Father in heaven, I thank you tonight that we can come to you knowing that you love us, 
that you care for us, that you save us. Father. Three ABNs, Ten Commandments Weekend 2009, Ancient Words Ever True continues in a moment. Stay with us. You are watching Ten Commandments Weekend here on Three Angels Broadcasting Network. I'm Carrie Christian. This is my dad, Jay Christian. And the speaker you've just heard is Jim Gilly, our president at 3ABN. Um, he's been speaking about the first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And, Dad, I really like what he had to say about is if you get this one right, you get them all right. Yeah, that's right. That's something that I actually hadn't heard before, Carrie, and that is... It's brilliant. I mean, it's it's perfect. It, it is, and it makes so much sense because uh, really, it's the first commandment, and it's it's the highest priority, and God put it first. So you get that yep. one right, you get them all. Yep, you're right. So I really I um, like that. Yeah. Me too. Tom Mann is our roving reporter. We have he a roving is. reporter this year. Who's he going to be talking to? And uh, he's going to talk to Greg Marconi. Oh, that would be interesting. We are down here, yes, with Greg Marconi, who's the head of the call center, and and we're going to talk about something very quickly. That I guess that's really important to me is that is the resources here at 3ABN. Uh, for instance, uh, the books, the CDs, the tapes, even the cookbooks, all kinds of things, and they're very, very important. And part of the reason for me it was one of the things that my wife kind of put to me, she gave it to me, basically, why don't you check that out by looking at this, and it really changed my life and brought me where I am. And Greg, so when I think about these resources, for instance, Ten Commandments yeah. Weekend, these are going to be available coming up over the next week or so. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Ten Commandments DVDs and CDs and those kinds of things? Yeah, that's right. You can actually get these DVDs by going online, actually. That's probably the best way, because I know there's a lot of different time zones and things like that. It makes it kind of confusing. We may be sleeping and you're awake, so go to www.3abn.org and click on the store tab. And you should find in the next couple of weeks some of these Ten Commandment Weekend programs available for you. And, you know, like I said, they're not just products, but they're really great, great That's evangelism right. resources. And, and for me, they really, I, I learned so much. Things I didn't know. True. And I learned about everything from uh, last year. Like, for instance, last year, we're just sitting here with this one. This yeah. is last year's. That's right. I learned so much about the commandments I had never heard. You know, a lot of times we think of some of these things as just for us. We may get it for our own enjoyment, our own remembrance of what happened to Ten Commandments Weekend, but we have to remember that 3ABN is here for evangelism, right, Tom? Exactly. So a lot of these things you can use as witnessing tools. You know, even here at Ten Commandments, we've heard some wonderful stories of how people are using the DVDs as a ministry for themselves, spreading God's Word by passing out DVDs. And the call center does a great job, and again, it's available uh, online through the e-store, which is what we call, and that's uh, pretty much available around the world. No matter what time zone you're in, where you live, or where you are, these uh, things are available. And thank you so much for all you do. And, and again, we want to remind folks that you need to share these resources, uh, the commandments and all of what you see, everything you hear this weekend, all 10, all the special programming, they're available on DVD and CDs at the times that we could, uh, you want to get them. So let's go back to you, Jade Carey. Okay, Tom, thank you very much. Well, we've got a speaker coming up, Carrie, and it's That's one right. of my favorites. Tell us about it. Yes, uh, Wentley Phipps is coming up next. He'll be talking about commandment number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Um, Wentley Phipps is a spirit-filled preacher. He's a world-renowned vocalist, and he's an innovative initiator of uh, special project, projects like um, the U.S. Dream Academy. He's the founder, president, and chief ex is a, executive officer of Dream Academy Incorporated. This is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to pro providing online, values-based, interactive uh, tutorials and remedial education for um, at-risk youth. He's sung for people all over the world like uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, Pres President Nelson Mandela, and many of the U.S. presidents. Uh, so we're looking forward to hearing him speak and uh, hopefully sing today, too. Yes, uh, and I'll tell you, he's an excellent speaker. We carry some of his programs as well on both uh, 3ABN television and radio. And he's a very interesting speaker. And uh, he has spoken all around the world, and he's going to do that again right now. So we're going to be heading back down in just a few seconds. We're going to be going down to Wentley Phipps.